Before we look into God's Word together, and you can turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, that's where we want to be this morning as we look at the announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus to Mary, we're going to pray together. So I'd invite you to join me in your heart as I lead us this morning. Father, we want to say thank you for your written word. For it's your written word that reveals to us the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living word. Father, this morning we thank you that we can gather in this place in a public way, that we can have a copy of the Word of God to study and read and allow the Holy Spirit to use in our lives. Thank you that we can raise our voices, that we have voices to raise. And Father, we thank you this morning as well for the radio broadcast that is being aired right now as we have this service here. And we're praying that it will return without void, but will accomplish a good purpose today. And those people that hear it right across the southwest of Saskatchewan. Father, may your word bear good fruit in their lives. Again this morning, Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters at Lakeview Bible Chapel in Fraser Lake, B.C., where Jay and Colleen are finishing up their last couple of weeks of ministry. We pray that your grace will be sufficient after seven years together to allow Jay and Colleen and their family to come here. We pray with them that you will send a servant who is anointed by you to pastor that flock of people. That that work will grow and flourish under the ministry of the new person. Father, we commit Jay and Colleen to you as no doubt it will be hard emotionally as they let go of friendships and visit with many people in these last two weeks. We pray for the Spirit of God to anoint his speaking. That he will speak with power and authority there. And then, Father, we ask for a safe journey from northern BC to here and your hand upon their ministry as they begin with us in the new year. We thank you this morning that you're here with us. Thank you that your Holy Spirit desires to teach us and draw us nearer to you. There's the work of the Holy Spirit who will reveal to us Jesus Christ and show us today what it is in the Word that we need to learn from and how we can apply it to our lives. So we invite you to do this, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Luke chapter 1 is where we are, and if you've ever looked into the scriptures and studied the subject of angels, it's a very intriguing study. I don't know how much you know about angels. In our January Bible study group in the afternoons, we're going to look at the subject of angels because there's just a lot of questions that swirl around in our mind wondering, what do angels do and what's their purpose and how much do they know and all those kinds of things. Angels are mentioned 273 times in the scriptures. That's a fair number of times. 34 out of 66 books, angels are mentioned. 17 in the old and 17 in the new. There's three occasions when angels are said to be singing and rejoicing. And they're very significant occasions. You're going to find the first one in Job chapter 38 and verse 7. God is speaking. He's speaking to Job. And he asked Job some questions. He actually asked a series of 77 questions at the end of Job. But he says this about creation to Job. On, or rather, on what were the earth's foundations set? Or who laid its cornerstones? Well, the morning stars sang together, and the angels shouted for joy. We have God's testimony that when he began a creative work, when, when he formed the earth and formed mankind from the dust of the earth, at that point, the angels just burst into song. I mean, they just couldn't contain themselves. They just, they sang out, they rejoiced, they were glad, they weren't jealous that now he's created us. They actually rejoiced in that. And then it's really interesting because you never see angels singing again over creation in the presence of mankind ever again in the Old Testament. It's almost as if that they kind of lost their song when we fell into sin. And so there's no more pictures of them singing over creation, singing over mankind, until you get to the New Testament. And that's how the Old New Testament begins. It begins with the heavens being opened up in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11. And what happens? The whole heavenly host appears, and they start singing, praise be to God, the highest. And then you know the message, and we're going to look at that later on in heaven. So the angels found their song again, and salvation came. And when God decided to send his son into this world to redeem mankind, the angels just couldn't contain themselves again. They just started rejoicing and singing. And then you'll find one more account of the angels singing in scriptures. And that's at the very end of the Bible. 
It's in the end of the book of Revelation, or actually in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, 11 and 12. And salvation has been completed. And the Lamb was upon the throne. And all the hosts are around the heavens. And this is what it says. Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne, the living creatures, and they were singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. So you've got these three pictures of angels singing and rejoicing, all in connection with creation. Creation of the earth, new creation that comes to us through Jesus Christ. And it's a great thing for us. Angels don't understand salvation like we understand it. They didn't need to be saved. In fact, Paul says that they long to look into these things pertaining to salvation. But one thing they do get really clearly. They understand how deeply loved the people are, God are, by their God. And I think that we forget that. Angels don't. So Daniel chapter 10, verse 11. God dispatches an angel to speak to the prophet Daniel. And before he gives him the message, the angel actually says this to Daniel. It's really interesting words. Daniel... You who are dearly loved. And then he goes on and tells them the message. But he just wants Daniel to know, Daniel, you are dearly loved by God. Okay, now I said that to you. Now I remind you of that. I got this message for you. Angels understand how greatly mankind is loved by God. There is no greater demonstration of the love of God for you than the fact that he would send his one and only son into this world and that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You won't find a greater demonstration or illustration of God's love than the birth of the Lord Jesus. Now, when it comes to these announcements, there's four of them in the scriptures, about the birth of the Lord. There's always an angel involved in each one. So, Zechariah and Elizabeth, an angel appeared to Zechariah. Mary here has an angel appear to her and speak to her. And then Joseph, we're going to look at this next week, he's struggling with the whole thing. And, and so, God dispatches another angel, and an angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and speaks to Joseph about it. And then Luke chapter 2, as we know, and we'll get there, but then all the heavenly hosts appear and angels are involved again. So every announcement of the birth of Christ that we have in the scriptures always involves angels. It's interesting for us. So Luke begins his gospel with two miraculous births. The birth of John the Baptist, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he kind of interweaves them together. He starts with John the Baptist's birth, goes to the birth of Jesus, goes back to the John the Baptist's birth, back to the birth of Jesus again. What we should remember is what he says at the very beginning of his gospel. So look at it in the first few verses with me, Luke chapter 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of these things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from whom the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. In other words, Luke says this. Look, at everybody who reads this, I want you to know that I did my homework. I thoroughly investigated all of this. I talked to ministers of the word. I talked to eyewitnesses. And, and I think, and most scholars think, that he talked personally to Mary. And that's where we get this account. Luke's exclusive in telling us about these things. And the way that it's written... You have to realize that he's speaking from somebody who knows personal information that nobody else knows. He's going to tell us today in this passage about what happened in an enclosed house between Mary and an angel. He probably got this information directly from Mary, who reminded him of this is how it happened, Luke. Let me just rehearse it to you. I'll tell you this. I'm glad to speak of it to you. And she would tell Luke, and he'd be writing on his little scribe in his notebook there. And then he took count and, and wrote the book. He tells us things that Mary thought in her heart. Twice he says, Mary pondered up all these things. This is what Mary was thinking, he tells us. How would he know that? I think because he talked to Mary. So as we take a look at this account, it's very trustworthy. It's very true. It's thoroughly investigated. This is not some fabricated story that, that a guy named Luke decided to write and thought it was kind of neat and impressed people. No, this is the living word of God given to us by the Spirit of God, that we might learn from it today and apply it to our lives. Now, as he begins a book, there's these two miraculous births. There's some comparisons and there's some contrasts. Angel Gabriel brings the message both to Zechariah and to Elizabeth. 
It's an advance notice of pregnancy in both cases. In both cases, it's a son that the angel's telling about. In both cases, the child is named before and named by God. In both cases, Old Testament prophecies are linked to their births. But there's also some stark contrasts that we should think about in these two miraculous births. One is to an old man named Zechariah. One is to a teenage girl. One is of lofty position, the priesthood, the aristocracy of society. One is to a girl with no standing. She's poor. She's in an outcast village. She really doesn't count for too much in Jewish society. One comes in Jerusalem where you would expect an announcement like this. In the temple, that's what we would expect. But this announcement is in stark contrast, comes in a home to a girl in an obscure village in a remote part of Galilee. In one case, the announcement comes to a father. In the other case, the announcement comes to the mother. In one case, Zachariah is commended as being righteous in the eyes of God. In the case of Mary, we're not told anything about her character, except that she is a virgin. In the one case, Zechariah is troubled by the actual appearance at the right side of the altar of this angel. But it's interesting, in this case with Mary, she's not troubled by the appearance of the angel. She's troubled by the words and the greeting of the angel. And that before she's even told that she's going to conceive. So it's very interesting as we contrast the two stories. Let's take a look at it. Chapter 1, 26 to 28, and notice with me God's chosen vessel, who is Mary, and his chosen place, which is Nazareth. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Back in verse 24, we find out once Elizabeth is pregnant, she goes into seclusion for five months, kind of in hiding. If, if she, as an older woman, was to say, hey, guess what, I'm pregnant, everybody would laugh at her. But she goes away in seclusion. When she comes out five months later, there is no more question. There's no laughing. She's pregnant. Can you believe that? Six months now. So a month has gone by between when she comes out of seclusion, I would suspect the people in the hills of Judea will already know that she's pregnant. I mean, have you seen her? You see Elizabeth? I think she's showing. I think she's pregnant. She is pregnant. She told me she's pregnant. You can imagine the chatter going on in the little village. Hills of Judea. But there's no internet. There's no instant news like we have. Mary does not know about Elizabeth yet. Wendy and I were in Regina last night. I was driving back. And as usual, I'm driving. And Wendy's doing something on her phone. She's on the internet. And she was on Facebook. And so she said to me, hey, she said, so-and-so had a baby 24 hours ago. A friend of ours. I said, well, that's pretty cool. She says, do you know in the last 24 hours there have been over 200 comments liking her birth? I was like, whoa, that's really weird. Like 200 people in 24 hours have already commented on the fact she had a baby in a hospital in Swift Current. That doesn't happen in Mary and Elizabeth's day, okay? There's been a whole month go by, she has no clue. Her cousin Elizabeth has had a baby or is pregnant yet. But she's about to find out and the angel brings the news. The angel is the one who tells her this. God's chosen vessel Mary. Just think about her for a few minutes with me. I don't know what you think of when you think of Mary and, and this story. Maybe, ladies, you think the time when you were engaged and, and how old you were and what it was like and da 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 da. Jewish culture, 12, maximum 15 years old. Well, that might shake you a little bit. So we're probably talking about someone who's 13, 14 years old. That would be just the target is what she would be in that society and culture. She's just a young teenager. She's not in her 20s. An angel comes to her and brings her this news. Remarkable. The idea between, behind highly favored is literally highly graced. In other words, Mary, you have received great grace of God to be the recipient of the mother of the Messiah. Mary is not a dispenser of grace. Make sure you understand that. She is a recipient of grace. Mary did not, there is no record anywhere to indicate to us that Mary would somehow have been praying, oh, let me be the mother of the Messiah, please, Jehovah, please. No, she's not seeking it. She's not asking for it. God steps into her life in time and history and says, I've highly graced you. You're going to be the mother of the long-awaited Messiah. 
We need to understand it. It's interesting, isn't it, that when the angel comes, the text says, the Holy Spirit says, the angel greeted Mary. The angel did not worship Mary. And neither should we worship Mary. The angel simply greeted Mary. Didn't bow in reverence to Mary in any way whatsoever. We need to understand that. And then the angel says two things to her, real significant things. He says, you're highly favored of God. Mary, it's the, it's the great grace of God that he's chosen you for this. And then secondly, he says, and Jehovah himself is with you. Now, all scripture is given by God and is profitable for teaching us. So let me say this to you, that in a secondary way, those two things are true of you as a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. You have received amazing grace of God that he would so choose you since the foundation of the world and set you apart and make you his own. If he didn't show you that amazing grace, you would still be dead in your sin. You would be blinded spiritually. You would not know the gospel. But by the grace of God who one day brought to your ears hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit convicted you and you realized that you were a sinner and needed saving. And then the Spirit of God said, and Jesus Christ is that Savior. And then by faith you placed your faith in it. That is solely the grace of God. And who are you that you would be so highly favored by God that he would snatch you out of the billions of people of this earth and make you his own? Your recipient of the grace of God. It's an awesome thing to give thanks for today. And not only that, the whole message. Next week we'll look at this. Angel comes to him, says, Emmanuel is his name. God with us. Mary, the Lord is with you. Wendy, the Lord's with you. Amber, the Lord is with you. It's a wonderful thing to know that Jehovah God, the creator who spoke all things into being, he's with me. He is on my side. He is for me, not against me. He is with me every moment, every second of every day. It's a remarkable thing. Now, if, if you were fabricating a story called the gospel, if this book was nothing more than man's invention, you would not choose someone like Mary. Are you kidding me? You would choose a priest of the higher up of society, in the temple, in a palace perhaps, but you certainly wouldn't choose a vessel like Mary. That makes no sense. But it does make sense. And it is inspired word of God. And it is true. And so Paul reminds us of that. And I want to just remind you of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. You can turn there if you want to. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or I'll just read it to you. Beginning at verse 26, Paul says this. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. That's what God did with Mary. Chose the least likely candidate. You say to yourself, well, I'm nobody. I have no gifts. I'm a loser. I can't do anything right. God says, that's exactly how I want you to be. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I am looking for those people that the world despises and say they have nothing. Because with me, they have everything. And because that's the kind of people that I want to use. God uses broken vessels. God uses the despised. God uses the lowly people of this world. We see that in Mary. Look in the mirror. You'll see that in yourselves. Not many of you. Well, there was a couple that were of noble birth. There's a few that were, you know, but most of us are exactly like this. And it's a good thing for us to be reminded of. So God didn't just choose an unlikely vessel in Mary. But you know what else he did? He chose the most unlikely place. So that son would be raised up in, that son would grow up in a community called Nazareth. Are you kidding me, Nazareth? Why the Jews, especially the Jews of Jerusalem, just despise Nazareth. You ever watch Corner Gas? You know what they do when they say Wolverton? You know, I'm not going to do that up here, but that's the idea of Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. It's called the, the Galilee of the Gentiles. It's called a despised place. Why? Because Herod, 
who's living at this time just outside of Nazareth, built a temple to a pagan god. And every year held pagan games there. This was the place right on the edge of Israel. Gentiles were constantly doing business in there. Some of them were living there and they're always going through there. Ugh, Nazareth, it's a horrible place. Never want to live in Nazareth. If there's anybody that knows what Nazareth is like, out of all the disciples, who do you think it would be? You know John chapter 1. Nathaniel, right? Philip comes and says, hey, we found the Messiah. Jesus of Naz N N N Nazareth. <laughs> he says, Nazareth! Exclamation mark. Are you kidding me? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He would know, and he would know because he lived in Cana, which is close to Nazareth. If anybody knew what a despised place that was, it would be Nathaniel. And he said, Nazareth? Philip, come on, are you kidding? Can anything possibly come out of that place? That's good. Yes, the Messiah can. You may say to yourself, well, you know what? Like, I just do this at work. Like, I just don't have much of a job at all. I, I, just, I just work here. I, I just come from current. Like, I, you know, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what God wants. That's exactly the place he wants you. And he brought his son up in a town that was remote and despised by everybody else. And that's the place that God chose. And that's the person God chose in Mary. So we should note that today. Now look at verse 29 with me. Let's take a look at what the angel says. God's angelic decoration comes to us in verse 29. Mary was greatly troubled by his words and wondered what kind of greeting this must be. See, she hasn't even heard anything about the conception yet. She's just troubled with the fact that that God would choose her? Are you kidding me? Like, who am I? Why would you favor me? Mary had nothing in and of herself. Nothing that we should worship her. Nothing that would somehow earn God's credit that way. She was troubled by it. Really, it means stirred. Her heart was stirred. Like, that. What, what's going on here? Angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. Second time he told her that. You'll conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. He'll be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Oh, how will this be, Mary asked the angel. I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative. It's going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. That's incredible to think about. So just think this through. Here's the message coming. It troubles Mary. The angel says you're going to conceive. And you're going to have a child. And there's no doubt about who this child will be, because he gives three specific things about this child that each one will be like a light going on in Mary's mind. Firstly, you were to call him Jesus. You were to call him Jeshua. It's a Hebrew name. It's from the Old Testament. It literally means Jehovah saves. That was reference to the Messiah. They all knew that. So the angel says to Mary, guess what? You're going to conceive Jehovah saves is going to be his name. I bet you there was a little bit of a flutter of the heart there. Like, like, like the Jehovah, the, like, like, like the Messiah, she may be thinking. And then the angel goes on, says this to her. It's going to be called great. And then in case there was any doubt, here's an undeniable Old Testament reference to the Messiah. He shall be called the Son of God, messianic name. They all knew that. Old Testament, that's what the Messiah was called, the Son of God. Mary, in case you've missed what I've said, he will be called the Son of God. Third confirmation. Mary, not only that, I want you to know something. This child's going to be conceived in your womb. It's going to reign on the throne of David forever. Messianic. There is no question. Three clear confirmations from the angel. This is no ordinary child that you're going to conceive of. This is not just a normal baby. This is the coming, long-awaited, prophesied Messiah. He's going to come. Now, then comes the news and Mary and says, like, well, how is this possible? Like, she's not doubting like Zechariah. Remember the angel said to Zechariah, because you doubted the word of the Lord, you didn't believe the word of the Lord, you're not going to be able to speak or hear until that baby's born. She's not doubting like Zechariah. She's just thinking in practical terms. She's just saying, okay, so I'm going to conceive. <laughs> I'm not even married. 
And I know you have to have a man to have a baby. Everybody knows that. So how is this possible? Like, practically speaking, like, how is that going to work? That's what she said. She's not doubting it. She just wants an answer to, so how will all this work out? Like, what, what's going to happen here? And then we have an interesting explanation, a very, very important explanation from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The word overshadow is literally hover over you. Does that ring a bell? Ring a bell from back to maybe Genesis, second verse of the Bible? That the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters of the earth? The Holy Spirit was overshadowing that formless void at that point, and the power of the Most High was at work there in creation. So the angel says, Mary, this is how it'll work. It'll work just like it did at the very beginning. The Holy Spirit is going to hover over you. And the power of the Most High is going to come upon you. And that one to be born in you will be holy. We need to understand what that means. Because if we don't, we're going to go way off the track and fall off the wagon theologically. It does not mean that because there was no earthly father with a fallen human nature, that's why... This baby was holy. That is not what it means. If you say that, if you say the baby was holy just because he didn't have an earthly father who impregnated this woman who had a sinful nature, if that's the case, what are you implying? You're implying then that Mary was sinless. You're putting all the emphasis on the fact that there was a no sinful father. Mary is not sinless. Jesus is not holy because of the virgin birth. Why is he holy? He's holy solely because of who he is. We need to take a look at the text again. It makes it really clear to us. Jesus Christ, this one conceived in the womb, is holy, and he is the Son of God, period. It's a soul work of the Holy Spirit. It's got nothing to do with Mary, sinful nature, Jehoshaphat, sinful nature. This is a work solely of the Holy Spirit. He is holy because he is the Son of God. That's why he's holy. In fact, if you look at the text carefully, you'll find out here that here's his position spoken of. He's the Son of God. That's his position. That's who he is. Here's his authority. He will rule from the throne of David forever. That's his authority. Here's his nature. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will cause this. That's his divine nature. So that we don't miss the point, the Spirit of God says, his position, Son of God. His authority, rule on the throne of God. His nature, solely by the power of the Holy Spirit that is happening. So don't just think it's a, a fact that Joseph wasn't involved and that's why he's holy. No, 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 that's to imply Mary was holy then. It can't have anything to do with either of them. It's got to do with the fact that God chose a vessel, a woman, to have a womb that his son could be conceived in by the power solely of the Holy Spirit and be born in that manner. We need to make sure we got that right. Because if we get that wrong, we're going to go astray in a lot of other areas that way. Now, we don't know what relation Elizabeth and Mary are. Just says you're a relative Elizabeth. I mean, we think, in our mind's eye, Jesus and John the Baptist first cousins. You know, like, well, really? Where'd you get that from? Doesn't say that in the text. Some of you are Mennonite here. Maybe it was a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth cousin. Who knows? You know how that goes. We don't know. Jews are the same way. They have all their relatives all lined up and lined out that way. We don't know what kind of relative they were. We don't know their first cousins. It just tells us they were relatives. That's all the text says to us. Elizabeth's pregnancy was miraculous. It was miraculous in that God brought, a, if I could use the term, dead womb way past the age of childbearing to life. And she conceived. That's a miracle. But this birth, the birth of the Lord Jesus, is miraculous in a total different way. This birth is a virgin birth. This birth is solely by the Holy Spirit hovering over Mary and by the power of the Most High creating that little baby inside that womb. Miraculous. Truly. Verse 37 is worth lingering on. Take a look at it again with me. It's interesting that she doesn't ask for a sign. Zechariah asked for a sign and he was in trouble for doing so. She doesn't ask for a sign. But God says, I'll give you a sign anyways. Your relative, Elizabeth, she's pregnant. But then as a second confirmation, this last line, verse 37, it's a much greater confirmation. 
It says, it says, for no word from God will ever fail. Some translations, for nothing will be impossible with God. I doubt whether any of you have it today in your hands, but the American Standard Version is an old one. I like what it says. No word of God will ever be devoid of power. That's the implication here. Who's speaking this to her? Gabriel. Gabriel said to Zechariah what? I stand in the presence of God. If anybody knew that God's word would never fail, it would be Gabriel. Gabriel was there in the presence of God when he spoke and said, let there be light and there was light. He was there when all that God said by his voice, by his word was established. And so Gabriel says, and by the way, not just as Elizabeth pregnant, but I just want you to know as well, nothing God says, nothing God says ever ceases to come true. It will definitely come true if God says it. Just want you to know that, Mary. Isn't that a great confirmation? See, it's a wonderful thing for us to think through the word of God and its implication. You can stand on the word of God. You can stake your life on the promises of this book. They are fully trustworthy, completely true. Test them and see. Work them out in your life. Believe what the angel said to Mary. No word of God will ever, ever fail. I used to go to Briarcrest when I was going to Bible school and you'd drive in there and they have a, I don't know if they still have it, they used to have there a, a sign, Psalm 40 verse 8. The word of our God shall stand forever. Grass withers, flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. That's what the angel said to Mary, worth thinking about. Now, Mary's response to this, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. That is a most remarkable statement to me. I, I just can hardly believe that she actually, we're talking about a 13, 14 year old teenager, who when she gets this news that she's going to have a child, and it won't be by a man, it's conceived by the spirit, and, and this is what God's going to do for you. And then the angel disappears. And she doesn't get a chance to ask one question. She says, just, just one second. My parents, like, how am I going to, you know, Joseph, how do I tell Joseph this? What am my dad going to do? See, fathers in those days, if their children in this predicament got pregnant, they could just put her out of the home. She could have nothing. There's a lot of risk here. There's a lot at stake here. What does she do? She just simply makes this statement. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled, period. She is so exemplary in what God desires for all of us who follow him. That's God's desire for us. That we would have a deep faith in his word and trust him. That we'd fully trust him, totally surrender to him, completely submit ourselves to him. Did you notice that there's nothing that happens from the time the angel leaves to the time she starts packing? She hurried to get ready to go to the hill country to see Elizabeth. No talking to Joseph. How do you explain this to your parents? 13, 12 years old. You don't let your 12 and 13 year old kids go a three day journey on their own in that time period. That would be extremely dangerous and you'd be foolish as a father to do that. How did that work out? All I can tell you is nothing is impossible with God, says the text. And however that was, how are you gonna to explain to your fiance? Joseph. I'm going to go visit my relative. Oh, okay, sure, that'd be great. So back like next week? Um, maybe three months. Three months? We're going to be apart for three months? What are you going to do? What are you going to do for three months? And you say to your parents, uh, Mom and Dad, I, I'd really like to go see Aunt Elizabeth. Oh, that's great. Well, go, no, actually, I just want to go on my own. Go on your own? Are you crazy? That's a three-day journey. I'm not sending you there on your own. I don't know how it worked out. I don't know how she ended up getting there on her own in those days and how they let them go and how Joseph let her go. All I know is nothing's impossible with God. And every word of God will never fail. That's what the text says. So I just believe it. And that's what it says right here. So off she goes to Elizabeth's house. Remarkable to me. It's so amazing to me. When you think about this, if you were to think of, just try this in your mind for a minute. Just think of one person in our church family one person that you would say, now, that person has deep faith. That person, I see in them total surrender and commitment and trust in God. So you got that person in your mind? 
Is that person 13? Oh, isn't that interesting? Here's a woman who's like that. Here's a woman that God singles out and says, this is a woman that I want to exemplify what it means to follow me. Wow, isn't that impressive? Isn't that amazing? I mean, you think of some of the great people in the scriptures. God called Moses to lead the people of Israel. What did Moses do? Are you kidding me, Lord? I can't do that. I can't even speak. And he complained and he whined and he had all the excuses. And finally, the Lord said, okay, fine. I'll send Aaron with you then. You think of Abraham, the patriarch of the whole nation, the man of faith, right? Who two times could not trust God with his wife. Had to lie about her. This is a 13-year-old girl. Total trust, total commitment, total belief in God's word. Off she goes to Elizabeth. But not only that, you probably didn't even think of this, did you? No, I know you didn't. Verse 40, where did she go to? She goes to Zachariah and Elizabeth's house. Duh, that's the cousin, right? Well, yeah, but think this through. What does Zachariah do? He's a priest. What do priests do? Well, they teach people God's law and they uphold the law and make sure the law is obeyed. Exactly. What's the law for becoming pregnant out of wedlock? Ooh, I get it. Do you see her faith? Do you see her trust? The last place you want to go when you're expecting a child out of wedlock, you're not married yet, the last place you want to show up at? A priest's house. Ooh. Yeah. She's total trust in God. I, I can just imagine her as, as the journey gets closer and closer and closer. And, and she can see the house in the distance. She starts thinking, okay, so what am I going to say? Like, how am I going to, I mean... What am I going to do? I want to make sure Zachariah is not there when I tell Elizabeth this because this could be death for me. Like it could be, how is she going to break it to Elizabeth? Elizabeth was so heartbroken. This godly woman, Elizabeth, who's righteous before the Lord. Everybody knows that. God declared that. How is she going to tell her, Elizabeth, I'm pregnant. You are what? What were you thinking? Joseph, oh, I can't, nothing like, how is she going to break this news? Isn't it wonderful when God goes before you? and just clears the pathway for you, and you don't have to worry about anything when you trust him. Just trust God and let him work it out. So she comes up to the door. I think, text doesn't say it, but I think it's probably Zechariah answered the door. Zechariah can't speak, right? So he answers the door, and, he's, and, and she starts talking. And, and, and Mary is talking to Zechariah, and Elizabeth hears, and it says in the text that when she hears the greeting, the baby loops in her womb, and she's filled with the Holy Spirit. See, God took care of it. And, and Elizabeth comes into the doorway, and she says, Oh, who am I that I'm so favored that the mother of my Lord would come to me? This is awesome. This is great. She didn't have to say one word. God took care of everything. Why? Because she trusted God. If we quit trying to manipulate things and take things into our own hands, I think we'd be much better off. She just trusted God. God took care of everything. And God took care of it all. And, and right at the beginning here, it's remarkable how this confirmation comes. Take a look at verse 41 with me. Let's keep going. I'm going to run out of time. Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. The baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you'll bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. There is no doubt. There's no arguing with God. She believed the message. Isn't it interesting that John the Baptist's ministry begins when he's still in the womb? <laughs> I mean, he, he declares the Son of God. I mean, he's not even born yet. And he's leaping in the womb. And she, being filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth, knows what that means and understands the Spirit confirms to her, this is the Lord. This is the long awaited Messiah, the promised one. It would have been remarkable. Now, you and I have the word of God. We have the written word that God speaks to us through. And, and she had some of the written word, but she also had the audible word of God through the angel. And it's great that we have the word of God. But honestly, don't you sometimes just love it when God affirms his word through a physical, tangible, real life person, flesh and blood? Don't you need people? Oh, okay. I need people. You might not. I need that physical, tangible, real life expression. God puts people into our lives for a reason. He puts people into our lives to confirm his word. 
to encourage us in the word, to build us up in the word. You need each other. You need the body of Christ. Look into the word of God. Moses had his father-in-law, Jethro, who spoke into his life. He had Aaron to speak into his life. David had Jonathan and the prophet Nathan. Paul had Luke and Timothy and other associates. Peter had John Mark. Ruth had Naomi. Esther had Mordecai. Who do you have in your life to keep you accountable, to pray with, to worship with, to cherish God's word with? You say, well, that's exactly my problem. I don't have anyone. Then I would say to you, you should pray that God would bring a man or a woman, whatever your case is, into your life who would be able to do that with you, keep you accountable. Iron sharpens iron. Someone to pray with, someone to worship with, someone to go to church with, someone to edify you, someone to encourage you when you're down. We need each other. And God knew that this young girl would need another woman, a godly woman in her life, and he brought Elizabeth and her together for three months. What did they do for three months? <sighs> you know what? If I was writing the book, I would, I would ask Mary a lot more things and I would have tried to maybe write down because I'm curious. I want to know, what did they do for three months? Seriously, three months. Joseph was counting the days off. Chick, tick, tick. Three months. They prayed together. They would worship together at that table. They would encourage it. These are two ladies who have never been pregnant before. They're going down this journey. Can you see them talking together, worshiping together, keeping each other accountable? And guess what, ladies? It'd be wonderful. There's no interruptions. Zachariah's lips are sealed. <laughs> he didn't say one word the whole time. He's like, mm -hmm. yeah, honey, sure. Okay. Now, and on they go. I mean, that would have been remarkable. For three months, they sharpened each other. For three months, they encouraged each other. For three months, they went back to the scriptures and reminded themselves of the promised coming Messiah. You need a brother, a sister in your life. And if you don't have someone like that, you need to pray and ask God to bring someone like that into your life. So important. Just one other side note, just like the angel, and I mentioned it to you earlier, but when Elizabeth meets Mary, she doesn't worship Mary. Did you catch that? She actually worships the Lord who's in Mary. We just need to note that. We don't worship Mary. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary was the physical mother of the Lord Jesus. Jesus came through her womb into this world. But we don't worship Mary. The angel didn't worship Mary. Elizabeth didn't worship Mary. Nobody in the scriptures worship Mary. We should just note it. Just be careful with it. Let me say this to you by way of application as we close this morning. There's four phrases in here that I just want us to think about as we go into a new week. And here's the first one, verse 30. You have found favor with God. Now, twice the angel says this, and they're two different words. Verse 28, the word favored is different than the word favored in 30. In 28, it means to bestow upon a specific person grace. God bestowed upon her specific grace to be the mother of our Lord. But the word in verse 30 is different. It's charis. It's a state of favor that you find yourself in with someone. And that applies to you and me. You have found grace in the eyes of the Lord if you're saved today. His amazing grace broke through to you. So amidst Christmas season, make a personal application. Take time to thank him that you found favor in his eyes. See, you have neighbors on both sides who don't know Christ. You have neighbors at work that don't know Christ. You have students you teach that don't know Christ. You have politicians that don't know Christ. You may have some people sitting next to you this morning who don't know Christ. But you do. If he's opened up your eyes, if you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you've found favor with God. That's a great thing to give thanks for this Christmas. Secondly, verse 28, the Lord's with you. If there's one thing Satan wants you to forget, it's that God's with you. If there's one thing he doesn't want you to be reminded of, it's that God's with you. Because when you're tempted, if you remember God's with you, you won't give in to the temptation. So he wants you to forget that God's with you. But the word of God says he's with you. And I'll never leave you. There's never a second, never a moment that he's not beside you. Don't forget that truth. Hold on to that truth. It may seem like God is so distant that God's nowhere to be found. My prayers feel like they're bouncing off the ceiling. God's with you. He said to his disciples, never will I leave you. 
I'll be with you to the end of the age. You're his. He's with you. You need to notice what uh, the text says to us in verse 37. No word from God will ever fail. That's another state in strategies. He wants you to doubt God's word. He started in the Garden of Eden. Did, did God really say? And that's never stopped. He wants you to doubt God's word. He wants you to think there's no difference. I've tried that. I've prayed that. I've read that. I just... God's word never fails, period, says the text. God's word is never devoid of power. We say, oh, but I failed so many times, or oh, I'm so weak, or oh, I'm so this, that. Alexander Stewart put it well. He puts it how God is so different from us. This is what he said. God is not limited by our limitations or our failures. God's not limited because you failed a hundred times. His word never fails, period. Then he went on and said, and he's not discouraged by our discouragements. You know what? When you give in to Satan so many times and you give in to temptation so many times, it gets discouraging, doesn't it? God's not discouraged by your discouragement. But we are his parents, aren't we? So sometimes as, as our children make choices and your little kids, when you try and teach them, don't touch that, and they just keep touching it, it's discouraging. Like, come on. I said no. Like, you know. And, and even as they grow older, there's certain things that happen that they can discourage us. God never gets discouraged by our discouragements. Isn't that great? Wouldn't it be terrible if we had a God who, oh, I'm so discouraged. Did you see my servant, Rob? He just, ah. Uh, God's not like that. He doesn't get discouraged by our discouragements. Then he went on and said, and he's not hindered by our shortcomings. See, no word of God will ever fail. God said, I will bring to completion the work I started in you. Period. No word of God will ever fail. Great truth. And then lastly, verse 38. Great response for us this morning as we go into a new week. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled in me. Isn't that a great thing to enter into a new week? See, you're the servant of the Lord. Servant of the God Most High. He's the Lord. We're the servants. We need to get this right. He's the king were the subjects. He's the master, were the slaves. He's the owner, were the owned. He's the beloved, were the loved. A great truth for us, Christmas season. He is the owner, I'm the owned. The beloved, I'm the loved. He's the master, I'm the slave. He's the king, I'm the subject. I am the Lord's servant. What an awesome thing. You are loved by the Lord. Go into this week and take those four statements and let them ring through your mind and your heart. And let the Spirit of God do a good work as we meditate on the Word of God and use us for His glory. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that Luke took it upon himself to write down an orderly account of the things pertaining to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. As we think of the second announcement today to Mary, Lord, she exemplifies what you desire of so many who are called your own, all who are called your own, that we would have a deep faith, a complete trust, a total surrender, and a quick obedience Help us in those things. Lord, may we not forget this week that we found favor with you. We've received your grace. You opened our eyes. You brought us out of darkness and placed us into your wonderful light. And thank you that you're with us. You're with us even when we don't feel it. You're always there. Thank you that no word from you will ever fail. No work of yours could ever be stopped. Thank you that you'll bring to completion the good work that you started in our hearts. And thank you for who we are. We're in Christ. We're the servant of the living God. May we be empowered by your spirit this week to live lives to your honor and to your glory. In your son's name we ask this. Amen.